Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. Now, there are a lot of great military strategists in history that come to mind when you mention military strategy. The most obvious one is Sun Tzu, wrote The Art of War thousands of years ago. There's also Karl von Clausewitz, but there's another one, one of the most greatest military thinkers and strategists since Sun Tzu. His name's John Boyd, and he started his career as a fighter pilot during the Korean War, and then he went on to revolutionize air tactics, um, the design of fighter planes. He also went on to just develop these grand theories that are being used today in branches of the military around the world on how to win wars. We've written about John Boyd on the site. He's one of the most fascinating characters I've ever read about and written about. So today we have his biographer on, his name's Robert Corum. He wrote this biography called Boyd, the fighter pilot who changed the art of war. Today we're gonna discuss John Boyd's contribution to military strategy, his life, his idiosyncrasies, his battles within the bureaucracies of the Pentagon. We're gonna talk about what we can learn from Boyd on being a better man and also learn from his faults as well. It's a fascinating discussion. I think you're really going to like this, so let's do this. Robert Corm, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Okay, so for our listeners who aren't familiar with you and your work, um, can you tell us a little bit about a background about your career and what ultimately led you to writing a biography about an obscure military strategist that not a lot of people know about named John Boyd? Uh, when I was uh, in college, I wrote for the student newspaper, and some of my columns came to the attention of uh, the people at the Atlanta Journal, and I was offered a job there and was there for four or five years and uh, left to freelance, write for Atlanta Magazine, wrote a number of magazine articles for most of the major uh, national publications, Esquire, The New Yorker. And then in 1980, I went back to the newspaper, this time to the Constitution. There were two separate newspapers at the time. And after a couple of years, uh, like every reporter, I wanted to write the great American novel. So I left the paper, and uh, I wrote five novels before I ever published one. So I had a rather long learning curve in this business. Um, In 1988, I published the first novel, and over the next 10 years, uh, published seven novels and three nonfiction books. And i got to tell you, except for one of those books, they were all somewhere south of mediocre. And by 1999, I was 62 years old. My career was in the toilet. Uh, My agent was about to fire me. And um, one of John Boyd's friends, whom I had known for 10 or 15 years and who had been after me for most of those 15 years to write a biography of Boyd, uh, contacted me again, and he said, it's time to write the biography of Boyd. And not having anything else to do at the time, I uh, thought I would go to Washington and talk to a couple of Boyd's friends, primarily to get Boyd's friend, uh, Chuck Spinney, who was a good friend by then, uh, to get him to leave me alone about this. Frankly, I didn't think it was much of a book. Uh, Chuck was big in the hero worship, but I went to Washington and talked to uh, Tom Christie and Pierre Spray and at length to Chuck, and I realized this is one of the biggest stories I've ever come across. So I wrote a proposal and sent it off. And that's how it happened. Well, I mean, okay, that's the thing that's amazing. So John Boyd, he is one of the greatest military strategists in the history of the world. And that's, some people have called him that. Like, he's up there with Sun Tzu. Um, but not a lot of people know about him. Uh, So for our listeners who aren't familiar with John Boyd, could you outline his career and his significant accomplishments? He was uh, probably the greatest military theoretician since Sun Tzu. He uh, wrote an energy maneuverability study he developed that changed aviation forever. He wrote an aerial attack study that changed the way Every Air Force in the World Fights, and Patterns of Conflict, which was his final work, was probably the most influential briefing ever to come from a military mind. But the thing you have to remember about Boyd is, even though what I wrote was a military biography, that Boyd's work transcends the military. His work has been embraced by academia. He's taught in uh, MBA programs all over the country. Uh, first responders, uh, police officers, fire departments all read about him. Homeland Security 
is in the process right now of developing a uh, using Boyd's OODA loop to try to fight cyber terrorism. Uh, almost 20 years after Boyd's death, there are conferences every year about his work. It's um, it's far beyond the military, and it's uh, approaching universal today. In any area of conflict, you can use Boyd's teachings. Excellent. And he also had a, played a significant role in the development of uh, new fighter jets, correct? He uh, was the father of the F-15 and the F-16. The F-15 has never been defeated in air air combat, and the F-16 – before the Air Force uh, added a lot of heavy weight to it, was one of the finest fighter aircraft ever built. So, yeah, and he was behind the scenes in building the A-10. So, yeah, he built, uh, was responsible for three of America's frontline aircraft back in the 70s, 80s. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, sort of his troubles getting what he wanted in a plane uh, a bit later. Uh, you mentioned the OODA loop, um, and... We've written about that before on the site. So OODA loop, for those who don't know, stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. Um, I know you're not an expert on the OODA loop, and, but can you just talk a little bit like what it is? And do you think a lot of people, you, know, you talk about how a lot of people are using it, but do you think a lot of people misunderstand what Boyd had in mind for the OODA loop? Let me back up just a little bit and say that when Boyd and uh, Chuck Spinney, who was working with Boyd, developed the OODA loop, they almost did not release what they had found because the OODA loop can be so powerful. It's virtually omnipotent if you truly understand the power of it and know how to put it into play. And they were afraid that some bad things could happen if if this were made public. But the good news about all this is that so few people understand it and even fewer know how to put it into practice. But it's, uh, as you mentioned, it's observe, orient, decide, and act. And where most people go wrong, two things, they underestimate the importance of the orientation phase. Um, that's a nonlinear feedback system. It's sort of a pathway to the unknown. And once you truly know a lot about whatever your area is. What you, when you develop what Boyd calls finger spitzing the fuel, it's a German word meaning a fingertip feel for something. You can skip the orientation and the decision phase, and you can look at something and make an immediate decision uh, if you have the fingertip feel for the situation. What you'll usually do is the least expected action which is always better than the most effective action because your enemy or opponent can figure out what's most effective just like you can, but what they can't figure out is the least expected action. And by doing that, you create confusion and ambiguity, and your opponent is sort of lost in the fog of war. And when he stumbles out the other side, he's way behind where you are in the, in the, the time cycle. Interesting. I don't know if that makes sense or no, not. It makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And I think a big part of the OODA loop is, it, you, you, you talked about this in an email, it's not quickness. It's You just want to control the, it's not fast. You want to be quick or like control the tempo. Yeah, yeah. Quick is more important than fast. Quick. If you get inside the tempo and act quicker than your opponent is, and he's always behind. And it, it doesn't matter whether you're playing tennis or you're in a, a combat situation. It doesn't matter whether it's a corporate takeover or... Uh, uh, any area of tennis match, any area of conflict, you can use this principle. Fascinating. And I think, why is it that more people don't know about John Boyd or that he was behind a lot of this, these really amazing theories about strategy and how to deal with ambiguity? Uh, Cause he, he, he was a very prolific, he put out a lot of presentations, um, but it seems like there's not a lot out there that he wrote specifically. I mean, there's like just a few papers or, that he wrote. Yeah, the military culture is an oral culture, and most of his work came in uh, briefings, and he only wrote a couple of things in his life, and therefore there's nothing for academics to pour over, and therefore he's been ignored by academics. Uh, uh, his greatest legacy is a, is a couple of briefings, but there's a, a, a website called Slightly East of New. It's run by Dr. Chad Richards, who was one of Boyd's close friends, and 
it's got a lot of articles on there about board, and all the board's work is is on there, including the patterns of conflict briefing. Excellent. Um, so John Boyd, uh, to say the least, was an interesting character. Uh, very brilliant, but he also had a lot of these idiosyncrasies about him. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, when I was reading your biography, like, I mean, I, I laughed out loud. Some of these confrontations he had or just some of these these little you know glitches he had that was part of his personality. Uh, can you talk about what some of his idiosyncrasies were? And were there any stories in particular that stuck out in his life where his personality um, clashed with others? Well, let me list some of his uh, better-known characteristics. He was ill-mannered. He was unkempt, loud, uh, opinionated, intolerant of anybody who disagreed with him. He had the table manners of a five-year-old. He was profane, one of the most profane men you'll ever meet, abrasive. He was a terrible father and a worse husband. Um, he had a habit of chewing on the quick of his fingers, and when he started working out with the weights, the calluses on his hand, he would chew on those and spit them out during meetings, which was sort of disconcerting to other people in the room. Uh, he smoked cigars and... Uh, several times we'd get so engrossed in the conversation he would stick his cigar into the tie or the shirt of the person he was talking with. Uh, after he retired, he was 48 years old, and he he looked like a homeless person after that. He kept his glasses in an old sock. Uh, he drove a rattle trap of a car. He said only two kinds of people can be truly independent, and that's those who have unlimited resources and those who have no resources. Because if you have no resources, uh, people can't uh, oppress you or do anything to bend you to their will, and you're as independent as someone who's uh, quite wealthy. And uh, Boyd was, uh, when he worked in his later years as a unpaid Pentagon um, consultant, he wore these old Bandelon flare-bottomed pants and a shirt that was tatty, and he truly looked like a homeless person. But he was one of those men who wanted to get as close to the truth as possible, and that was the only thing in his life that mattered. He, there is no absolute truth, but he came closer than most people to finding it, and he, he saw himself as an outsider, as a man of virtue who was battling superiors who were devoid of virtue. And uh, going back to having a cause, it's something I think every man, especially young man, want is a cause, and those of us who can can find a cause are fortunate indeed and Boyd uh, found a cause and um, didn't care about all the other stuff he was one definition of genius is the ability to concentrate on one thing to the exclusion of all others and Boyd uh, concentrated about a hundred percent on his work he ignored his family it was uh, it was terrible it was embarrassing to his friends the way he ignored his family but you know, not everybody can make that sort of trade-off, but um, but Boyd did, and his work work lives on. As I read your biography, I was trying to think, like, what was driving Boyd? Was it just like he wanted the truth? Like, it was it for country? Was it for, I mean, it wasn't for money, obviously. He could have made a lot of money being a consultant right. and doing lectures and the, the sort. But was it patriot? Or was it just like he just wanted to figure this thing out? That was it. Well, it started out, he went into the military to be a fighter pilot, and uh, all of his work, everything flowed from what he learned as a fighter pilot in Korea in the early 50s, flying an F-86 Sabre jet, which had a 10 to 1 victory ratio over the MiG, and the MiG in many ways was a superior aircraft. So when you work for Uncle Sam, especially in the military, you've got virtually unlimited resources, and Boyd could not have done several of the things that he did, the uh, energy maneuverability study, the uh, uh, fighter aviation survey, uh, had he not been in the military. I mean, how, how can you strap a computer in the back of a fighter jet to test the principles of the energy maneuverability theory? A civilian simply couldn't do that. So a lot of Boyd's engineering kind of work, if you will, was done while he was in the military, and he uh, had a fiduciary responsibility as a rather senior officer in the Pentagon, and he was uh, did not like the culture of the Pentagon, and um, 
uh, created a lot of confusion and discord among defense contractors, but uh, his greatest legacy is intellectual work came after he retired. He was in his 50s when uh, he developed uh, patterns of conflict in the Um So yes, yeah, talk about the culture of the Pentagon when Boyd, Boyd eventually ended up working in the Pentagon. Can you describe what the culture was at the time? Because uh, it seems like it was, you know, you describe, you kind of talk about it like sort of a lot of butt kissing and backstabbing, infighting, um, and that Boyd really wanted to change that. Well, uh, he tried to change it, but it, it's even worse today than it was when Boyd was there. People outside the military think of the Pentagon as a place where they all these patriots are building weapons to defend America. And and there are great patriots and principled men and women who work in the Pentagon, but the fundamental purpose of the military, industrial, political complex is not about protecting America. It's about funneling money to defense contractors. Uh, The Pentagon's books have not been audited in decades, and it's for the simple reasons they made deliberately made the book so complicated no one can figure them out there's so much money involved in so many congress the f-35 for instance the joint strike fighter that's being developed now has hundreds of subcontractors and they're in most congressional districts in every state in the union and the constituents of the congressmen and the senators there uh want to keep those jobs so this horribly expensive airplane for which there is no threat in the they're trying to kill the a-10 to make room in the budget for the um, f-35 uh, it's a corrupt venal uh terrible institution and most most people think of it as um they're there to help us and protect us, and, and they're not. They're, and many of the two- and three-star generals who retire, something like 70%, go to work for defense contractors when they retire. They're going to work for the same people that they have regulated or whose projects they have controlled uh, as two- and three-star generals. It's a, it's a venal, corrupt system. Yeah, you describe in the book that one of the things that Boyd would do, he kind of used the OODA loop. Uh, within the Pentagon, I feel like uh, some of the, the things that he was theorizing at the time to sort of create discord and confusion. And you, you call it was like a you called it like he would he called it a cape job, right? Whenever he pulled the, the wool over someone's eyes within the Pentagon. Well, a cape job was when he, for instance, when he was delivering the briefings on the energy maneuverability uh, study and uh, he was uh, confronted during the briefing and someone tried to uh, diminish his work and say, this has all been done. And he would say, okay, tell me your source for that. He used other people's words and information against him, which is devastating if you can do it. And he would ask the person to tell me the source for that. Where did you get this information? You tell me who did this work before, and if you're correct, I'll step aside. And, of course, nobody had done the work before. So Boyd said that, by asking leading questions like that, he was holding out a cape, and the bull charged and went headlong over the cliff. And he he was a master of that technique. So, so I guess the question is like, why Boyd seemed like someone who didn't really fit in with hierarchy. And I guess it was that whole fighter pilot mentality. Um, it seems like that was sort of the culture with amongst fighter pilots at the time, and I guess still today. Um, but you know, in a military, it's very very hierarchical very structured. Why did he stick around uh, instead of pursuing civilian work? And did he ever think about pursuing civilian? I mean, did he ever have those moments like, I'm just done with this, I want to go do something else? Yeah, he made a couple of feints at retiring, but what he was doing was too important for the country, and he knew that, and he stayed, and he knew he would never be promoted beyond colonel. Uh, if you look at the awards he won and the thing, his contributions to the military, it's, few people in military history have contributed as much as he did, but he worked outside the system. He stood up and was recognized as an opponent to a lot of senior officers, so his career came to an end. The irony here is, and I've discussed this with uh, Air Force Academy people, and they say that in all the service academies do this. They teach their cadets, their students, to be principled people and people of honor, to always do the right thing. But what they don't teach them 
is that when they stand up and be like Boyd, that there's a price to pay. When you do the right thing, there's always a price to pay. And many of these young officers who graduated and were fans of Boyd find out to their utter dismay that their careers have gotten sidetracked by doing what they thought was the right thing. Hmm. Something we haven't talked about is um, Boyd's career as a fighter pilot. Um, And before he got into all the, the the energy maneuverability theory and the OODA loop. But he was actually one of the best fighter pilots in the history of the Air Force. They called him 42nd Boyd or 22nd Boyd. Yeah, that was in the uh, 60s after he came back from Korea. And, and when you look at his career, yeah, you can't connect the dots until you look back. And when you look back at his career, you can see the stepping stones and how he developed and evolved always in an upward fashion. And, and um uh, When he came back from Korea, he just had a passion about trying to figure out why the F-86 had such a high victory ratio when it was an inferior aircraft. And he would put all that to play as an instructor in what was then called a fighter weapons school at Nellis Air Force Base uh, near Las Vegas. And uh, he had a standing offer to let any student, and these are the best fighter pilots in the Air Force who come out to the fighter weapons school, he would put them on his tail in the 6 o'clock position and guaranteed that in uh, 40 seconds he could reverse their positions and be on their tail. And he did it by a rather drastic maneuver that nobody else uh, had the courage to emulate. They, and he, he won every one of those engagements. Wow. And like, yeah, you, whenever you get up behind someone, you'd say, guns, guns, guns. That's like. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of... you need I mean, something like three seconds saying guns, guns, guns. It's equivalent to 16 films of uh, gun camera film, which is considered enough for a kill. And uh, just as a student was getting ready to hose him, he would reverse positions and he would be on their six screaming guns, guns, guns. Yeah. I think there's a few instances where he did that to, like, planes who weren't even, in like, involved in training. He would just, like, sneak up <laughs> behind them and just scare the crap out of them. The uh, one was a B-52 landing at Eglin. And yeah. those, back back in the day, the B-52s flew these long 10, 12, 14-hour missions. And this guy was coming in to land, and he was in the landing pattern, and these guys were exhausted. They wanted to just go through the debriefing and go home and sleep for two days. And Boyd makes a head-on pass at the B-52 and rolls inverted right in front of it and goes under it. He was so close they could count the rivets on his belly, and he was screaming, guns, guns, guns. And the pilot, the aircraft commander got really upset and was just raising cane over the radio. And Boyd decided he needed another lesson about what amazing people fighter pilots were. So he made a an attack from the side, a deflection attack, and uh, came right across the cockpit. And uh, he got grounded because of that. But the B-52 pilots uh, learned uh, a little bit more about fighter pilots. <laughs> um, I found this was amazing. You know, despite his contributions to military strategy, and particularly to designing new generations of warplanes and like just basically revolutionary, revolutionizing uh, air combat. When Boyd died, there was no member of the Air Force that attended his funeral. Um, do they claim him? And But in, in fact, it was filled with Marines. Um, but can you explain like why were Marines like in, you know, kind of went there to honor, pay respects to Boyd, the Air Force didn't? Uh, let me back up again to when the book came out. The venom uh, toward me and toward the book from the Air Force was just startling. I, I never expected that. But uh, Chuck Spinney, uh, one of Boyd's friends, still worked in the Pentagon at the time. And he called and said, you better stand by for some incoming fire there after you. He said two full colonels in the Air Force had been assigned the job of debunking the book. And they didn't have much luck with that. But uh, there was also a professor over at the Air War College in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, who is the only person to write a really mean, nasty, critical review about the Boyd book. And today, even today, they hide Boyd material at the Air War College because they think these young majors and lieutenant colonels will have their minds poisoned by uh, reading Boyd. And uh, at the Air Force Academy, they have what they call a class exemplar for each class. And this is uh, 
to pick someone who is a role model of what these young cadets want to be in their careers. And four or five times the senior class has tried to pick Boyd as the exemplar. In every instance, senior officers have stopped them from doing that. Uh, so even today, uh, and, uh, here's a story about that. I, I, I wrote another military biography about a Colonel Bud Day, who's the most highly decorated officer and a, a great story about his being a POW in Vietnam. And I was at a, a reunion of, of pilots, and the chief of staff of the Air Force was there, and he came over and he said, thank you for writing the Bud Day book. Uh, the Air Force needs to recognize his heroes. And I said, well, why don't you recognize John Boyd? And he spun on his heels and walked away. Um, even today, the Air Force... Uh, refuses to give him the institutional recognition he deserves. And I get emails from young officers uh, two or three times a week, and they've read the book, and they say, well, when we get to be senior officers, we're going to change that. We're going to recognize Boyd. And what they don't understand is that they will never be really senior officers until they drink the Kool-Aid, and that means they're not going to recognize Boyd. So... I'm not sure the Air Force will ever honor and recognize Boyd. And that's okay. The Army's recognized him, but the Marine Corps most of all, because the Marine Corps is always fighting for its very existence, and they're always looking for something new and something innovative. They really latched on to Boyd's ideas, and because of him, the Marine Corps changed the whole way it went to war because of Boyd, and he's today uh, is one of the iconic figures uh, in the Marine Corps. An Air Force pilot who's recognized as a great military theorist by the Marine Corps, which is, if you know military culture, that's impossible to grasp. Yeah, and they, I think you said at, at his funeral there was actually, like at his burial, they, they the Marines did something that they don't, they only do for Marines, but they did it for John Boyd. Uh, one of the Marine colonel, a highly decorated uh, combat officer, uh, took the Eagle Globe and Anchor, which is the insignia of the Marine Corps, and put it on the urn at, uh, at Boyd's funeral. And uh, that's unprecedented. It's rarely done at the funerals of Marines. And to do it for a retired Air Force colonel, it, there's no precedent for that. But the Marines love John Boyd. Yeah, because I, I guess uh, they I went on in the, the first... Uh, desert Storm in the 90s, they used a lot of Boyd strategies to basically take down Kuwait like in a few days, right? Or take back yeah. Kuwait. Boyd had retired by then, but uh, Dick Cheney, who was Secretary of Defense, had been a young congressman when Boyd first started working on his ideas. And as a congressman, had been to a number of Boyd's briefings and he knew Boyd and liked him and uh, had a pretty good understanding of his work. And when he was Secretary of Defense and uh, Schwarzkopf was beating his chest and pounding and jumping up and down, Cheney called Boyd out of retirement and brought him to Washington, and they talked about how to conduct warfare. And that left hook and the, the feint by the Marines, uh, the whole battle plan came from John Boyd. And um, when Cheney was vice president and I was working on the book, uh, I made arrangements. To my surprise, he took about 15 or 20 minutes to talk to me about Boyd, and he was open in his uh, acknowledgement of Boyd's contributions to him as Secretary of Defense. So Boyd would famously tell the young men he mentored uh, something all the time. It's it's a phrase that um, sticks out to me, that stuck out to me in the book, and it was that you can either be somebody or you can do something. Uh, what did John Boyd mean by that? Brad, you picked out the one part of the book that probably has drawn the single greatest response. I would say most of the emails I get from men, and, and 95% of my emails about the book are from men, the thing that most of them glom onto is the to be or to do speech. And In essence, he would take a young officer and he would say that in life there's a roll call and you have to decide what you want to do. And he would point off to one side and say, uh, if you want to be somebody, you can go that way. And your friends will like you and you'll get good assignments and promoted faster and uh, your career will be good. But uh, at the end of the day, 
the end of your career, the end of your life, you might wonder what the hell it was all about. And then it would point the other way and say, if you want to do something, you can go this way, and you will not be popular, and you may not get promoted, and you won't get good assignments, but you will have done something for yourself, uh, for your branch of the service, and for the country. And he said, every man comes to a fork in the road, and you have to decide if you want to be somebody or to do something, and which way do you want to go? And it... uh, yeah, when I was writing, I didn't realize the impact of that. But, uh, again, you picked out the, the single uh, part of the book that most people respond to. Yeah, it's it's really it's a really powerful, powerful speech. Um, it's convicting is what it is. Um, what did you personally learn about being a, a man, you know, whatever that means uh, to you, um, from studying Boyd's life and writing about it? Uh, Let me respond on two levels. Uh, Professionally, uh, Boyd uh, changed my life. Uh, As I said, my career was sort of bottomed out uh, when I I wrote that book. But when the publisher got the book, he sent me a contract for two more books, a two-book contract, and it stipulated that uh, each book be a military biography. I never planned on this. I, I, I didn't see myself writing military biographies and i went back and reread boyd to try to figure out you know what was it about him that made the publisher want two more books about military people and uh, i think we talked about how boyd loved the truth he was a man of commitment and passion and principle Uh, he was somebody who wanted to do something and Brett, the irony is that my heroes have always been men of conviction, uh, men of belief, uh, men who uh, sacrificed for their beliefs, who suffered. Uh, Sir Thomas More has always been a great hero of mine. So is St. Gregory, who spent years in jail for his beliefs. And the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was jailed and later killed by the Nazis. These are my heroes. And then I wind up writing books about people who manifest those same characteristics. Uh, Colonel Bud Day, who was the topic of my the subject of my second book, um, was a POW in Vietnam. And, and I, there's a chapter in that book I still can't read without weeping, and it's the chapter when Bud was being tortured, and uh, they were going to kill him, and he would have died for his beliefs. And what gets me is it would have been so easy for him to stop the torture. All he had to do was to sign a paper saying he thought the war in Vietnam was unfair, unjust. And everybody in America was saying that. The Attorney General of the United States said it was an unjust war. Half the members of Congress were saying that. And that great exemplar of all things good and noble, Jane Fonda, was saying the same. Everybody was saying that. But Colonel Day was a serving officer in the hands of the enemy in a time of war. And he did not have that luxury, and he would have died before he had broken his oath. And then the next book, finding a subject is always the hardest part of what I do. And the next book was about uh, Lieutenant General Victor Krulak, Brute Krulak. And the essence of his life is that um, he was a three-star general about to be a, a receive his fourth star and become commandant of the Marine Corps. And of his own volition, and that's a crucial thing, He he went to the White House of his own volition. He was the only senior officer in the military during that long war in Vietnam who went to the White House and confronted President Johnson over the prosecution of the war. And he said, you're doing this wrong, and unless you change everything you're doing, you're going to lose the war, and you're going to lose the next election. And Johnson was so annoyed, he stood up and put his hand in the small of Krulak's back and physically pushed him out of the Oval Office. And Brew Krulak, because of being a man of principle, did not get his fourth star. He did not become Commandant of the Marine Corps. He, his life's dream was gone because he acted on principle. And that's how he's remembered today. And I don't think Lyndon Johnson is remembered by history in the same light. So uh, moving on to a personal thing, uh, what Boyd taught me about being a man, it, uh, I saw in these, in first in Boyd and then in uh, Colonel Day and then General Krulak, the same 
attributes, the uh, devotion to duty, commitment, never making an excuse, doing the job no matter the cost. My dad spent 31 years in the Army, and he and I didn't get along. And uh, for most of my life, I was running from everything he represented. But when I started 50 years after my dad died, uh, writing about military people, I realized they, my dad had the same virtues, qualities, attributes that these people had that I was writing about. He was, I was writing about my dad. And um, late in life, I, I realized I had um, rejected a rather priceless gift from my father. And uh, I got right with him on that. I visit him in the cemetery every time I go home, and we have a talk. And uh, so I have learned both. Uh, Boyd turned my life around professionally, and enabled me to a much higher level of understanding, not only about my dad but about military people in general. So uh, Boyd changed my life. All right. Well, Robert Corm, thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolute pleasure. You're welcome. Our guest today was Robert Corm. He's the author of the book Boyd, The Fighter Pilot Who Changed the Art of War. He's also written a whole bunch of other books as well. You can find all of those on Amazon.com. Highly recommend you pick up the Boyd biography. Super interesting. You also find out more about Robert's work at robertcorm.com. That's Corm with the C. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And again, I really appreciate your feedback on the podcast. If you can give it a rating on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever it is you use to listen to the podcast, we listen to that. Uh, I've been trying to improve the sound quality on that, some of the balance. I've had a lot of complaints about that think we're getting there. Also let you know what I'm doing. I've bought some equipment that will make recording telephone interviews much better and sound better because I, I know there's been a few complaints about that as well. Um, hopefully we'll get that fixed. We're always trying to improve the podcast so your feedback is welcome. And also I'd love for you to go to the, uh, the post that we publish the podcast on, on Art of Manliness and leave a comment about the podcast and it, also suggestions for future podcast episodes. Who do you like me to interview? I like to interview people not just have me blather. So if you have anybody you'd like me to talk to and reach out, let me know. I'd really appreciate that. Until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly.